So uh, Garfield, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready to go. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce, I'll let Garfield introduce himself. But I'd like to welcome you to um, Structures for Promoting Deep Understanding with Garfield Jeannie Newman, um, the OTF Connect session. Um, it's always great to see people from all over Ontario joining us for these sessions, and I know that you're going to have a uh, um, really informative and interesting time of great um, ideas and conversations surrounding deep understanding. So I'm going to turn it over to Garfield. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, in addition to that uh, kind of geographic sense of, of who we have with us tonight, would you mind just in the in the chat box just to give me a little sense of the range? At what grade level do you teach? And um, if you have a specific subject area, what subject area uh, do you teach? So just give me a little bit of context from you know K to 12 and the range of subjects that, that we're talking about this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, fascinating range that we have here uh, from kindergarten through to grade 12. Looks like we have quite a few people in the in the high school and across subjects, so I think that's great. And we'll look at, at how well we can get the pieces all to fit together tonight as, as we share our ideas. Just a little bit of context. You can see on this first slide that uh, uh, one role that I play is I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Um, in, in the curriculum teaching and learning department. And the other hat uh, that I wear is a senior consultant with the Critical Thinking Consortium. And uh, the work we do is uh, trying to find ways to help embed uh, critical thinking and, and kind of deep understanding um, for children across grades from kindergarten to uh, graduate school, in fact. And, and, and the work uh, takes us, uh, it takes me kind of all around the world looking at this. Uh, in fact, in September, I worked with a school in Singapore, an IV school, with teachers uh, across grades from kindergarten to high school. And a uh, week, week and a half ago, I was in Peru, uh, a fascinating project called the Nalma Foundation, working in remote indigenous communities high in the Andes, uh, looking at ways to improve the quality of education with children in these remote communities uh, by infusing a project-based learning grounded in critical thinking. And so that was an interesting, and, but the point being, uh, this interest in, in deeper understanding uh, in a critically thoughtful approach uh, has interest uh, from what we're seeing uh, across Canada and in fact internationally. So what I wanted to tonight, and I'm hoping it will be a super practical by giving you strategies you can try out tomorrow in your class and we'll talk and think about how they might play out. Uh, one, one other question before I, I launch into the slides that we're going to look at. Uh, if you could give me, uh, and, and perhaps Mala, if you can help me set up a, a scale from one to five, uh, one being, and so all you have to do is give us a, a number, um, I think we can vote this way or, or indicate, am I right? No? I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so what I want... What I want to look at is how many of you, uh, one, uh, little or no uh, exposure to the work of the Critical Thinking Consortium, uh, you know, uh, fairly unaware of the work, and five being uh, attended several sessions, have done lots of work. So if I were to give you that kind of continuum from uh, virtually no work with the, with the consortium uh, or lots of work with consortium, where would you be on a scale of one to five? Um, I had to actually set up a poll from A to E, so it's in the polling tool right now. So then we'll be able to take a look at it. Okay, great, thanks. And what I'm seeing is, much like our grade range from kindergarten to grade 12, I'm, I'm seeing 
And Jody, I like the 3.5, just to slightly over that middle ground, so leaning towards is great. Uh, I'm seeing quite a few uh, ones, uh, some fours, some people have done a fair bit of work. The, the reason um, for me asking this question is uh, to give me a sense that you know, before we delve into uh, the structures that would promote thinking, uh, the need to try to build a little, make sure that we're on the same page and we have some bit of context. So I'm going to uh, start there, but I want to start with this, uh, and I'll give you context, and I'd love uh, and by the way, this is where you can jump on the mic in response, or you can uh, type in a response. These are two quotes uh, that I've been sharing with people lately that I've come across in the last year. So the one at the top suggests that a teacher's job, as you can see, is to inspire students when they get out of their way. Let's just pause on that one for a moment and, and ask you, uh, does that statement, uh, do you find yourself applauding it and, you know, in hearty agreement? Or do you find yourself with a bit of a red flag, saying, you know, that concerns me, um, or somewhere in between? Well, how do you respond to this notion that our jobs as teachers is to inspire kids and then get out of their way? It depends on the grade level. Aspiring to it? I have a hand. So, um, Ronnie, uh, you have a comment? I'll, I'll turn off my mic so we don't get a feedback. Do you want to make a a comment, just click on the mic and I'll, I'll turn it over to you for a moment. Oops, sorry, I'm talking to myself. That was an away click, not, not. Okay, so I'm seeing a number of you, uh, so wanting, I think we're, where I'm seeing common agreement, and, and correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing Yes, we want to inspire kids, and, and, and we really want to find ways to excite kids to learn. Where I see less consistency, uh, notice I see, uh, for example, Natasha, that there's a balance. Uh, so I want to inspire, uh, I see something, you know, who, uh, Justina, that we need to provide foundational concepts. That this notion that our job is to inspire and then get out of the way, I, I personally have some red flags to go off and get out of the way. I think it undervalues the important role that teachers play. That, yes, I agree we want to expire and excite kids. In fact, uh, I did a TED talk about two weeks ago uh, that, um, on wonder-based learning. How do we inspire wonder in kids? Uh, but the second point of my TED talk is we need to inspire wonder, but we also have to build the intellectual tools kids need to allow them to wonder in, in deep and thoughtful ways and not, not surface ways. And I think that should be posted this week, so I'm, I don't know if I'm looking forward to watching myself. That, that makes me a bit nervous. But anyway, yeah, I want to I raise this issue. Uh, is our job to get out of the way, or is our job to excite kids, but then guide them and provide the toolkit that they need to be successful? I get worried about us getting out of the way because some kids simply get lost and overwhelmed with inquiry. They, they don't know what to do. They don't know what information they need, how to use it. So, you know, I want to just, uh, you know, to, to be, and, and this may, I may be reading too much into the statement, but, you know, just being careful that uh, is it enough simply to inspire kids or do we have another role to play? Now, let me take, uh, to just have you take a look at the one on the bottom. This one, I was visiting one of my students in their, uh, in their practice teaching blog. It was a grade 10 class, a history class, and he was doing a lesson on the end of World War II, and it was a beautifully uh, done PowerPoint Lots of good, rich content, really nicely set up slides, and 75 minutes of pure content delivery. Uh, not once were the children invited to turn and talk to each other. Uh, not once uh, were they invited to, to uh, think about a provocative question and response. It was purely content delivery. And, and he was one of my top students. So in the debrief, I said, well, you know, I'm a bit disappointed in that lesson. Um, you know, my course has a lot of focus on, on critical thinking, and yet I just watched the lesson of pure content delivery. And this is the quote he gave me. He said, well, my associate teacher has told me many times that sometimes you just have to teach content. You can't do critical thinking in every lesson. I'd love to get your response to that. I mean, just if you, if you would, just type a thought. And do you agree that, that sometimes, uh, and some people have made references to foundational content, are there times or days or periods where I just have to relay content to kids? 
or would you disagree with that, that, that thinking can always be present in a class? So let me, let me get your thoughts on that. I'm just going to talk on night for a moment and just let a few comments roll through on whether or not content I mean, some days we just teach content. We can't always have kids think. I think Garfield's just asking us to think about that. Can you hear me now? Oh, sorry. Did my mic turn off? Yeah, it did. <laughs> I wonder how long I've been babbling to myself. <laughs> I do that all the that. time. <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> well, at least I had no disagreements in that, in that section. Uh, what I was saying is in, in, um, in late August, uh, I, had, had, I gave a talk to 300 professors at the University of Western Ontario. And uh, they were across departments, uh, math, science, uh, geography, history, and so on. And I put up this slide, and I asked them to, to respond. And uh, what I was asking uh, when you weren't there, when I wasn't on, uh, it, how do you think these 300 professors responded to this statement that teaching content should not be seen as a goal of education, but rather a necessary intellectual tool for solving problems or responding to issues? How do you think they responded? To this statement, do you think they were, uh, you know, applauding it? Do you think they were concerned by it? I'll just give you a minute to to respond to to my question. How do you think professors across departments at a university would respond to this a statement like this? Jane, I love that you, you you put that note down that we are doing critical thinking right now, um, and it's it's very pleasing for me to see that that uh, you'll notice that hopefully the way I present throughout the evening is always to include a provocation of some kind, even if I'm if I'm sharing uh, content with you, it, it will hopefully always be in, in the context of an invitation to think. So so your thoughts on on how how do you think they they responded. 
focuses imparting content. Okay. By the way, let me ask you this. Is this statement a, a pro-content statement or an anti-content? Is this statement saying we, we should teach content or is it opposed to teaching content? Yeah, this is meant to be a pro-content statement. What I'm saying, you'll notice I'm saying uh, teaching content is not my goal, but it is, and I, I want to highlight, it's a necessary intellectual tool. You can't think about nothing. So this very notion that we could teach critical thinking devoid of, of a context, devoid of content, you can't engage in thoughtful, uh, critically thoughtful learning or reflection or responses if you know nothing about what, what you're talking about. Uh, I would argue that teaching content is absolutely our job as teachers. It is to help kids build the background necessary to be able to solve complex problems or make thoughtful decisions. But as we were saying on the last slide, and what I'm hoping to show tonight with the structures we're going to get to, uh, teaching content does not mean is not critical thinking. The point of these two slides is to say, of course we teach content, of course it matters that we teach content in the service of being able to respond in thoughtful ways to issues that matter. So content is a tool. Kids need it. Um, we have an expertise often that we're going to share. One of the lines I often use with teachers, I don't teach answers. Uh, I don't teach answers. I teach kids the tools they need to arrive at their own answers. And sometimes that means building their background knowledge, but I don't answer the provocative question. And I just wanted to show you, oh, sorry, this slide was supposed to break down a bit, so I'll try to speak to it. Um, I want to suggest to you that, and try to ignore the, the slide on top, but uh, I'm going to just a little bit of context here, that I think in schools we need to move from what I would call knowledge hierarchies to what I would call knowledge networks. And what I mean by knowledge hierarchies is I think for students, and, and um, let me just um, ask, ask you, you know, Agree or disagree, I suppose. Well, you don't need to. I'll take too long. Uh, students often uh, will, if it's in the textbook, they, they agree, that they assume it's true. Uh, I think many of you have probably experienced, um, uh, experienced this, that, that I saw it online, it must be true. It's in the textbook, it must be true. This is because kids see school often as a knowledge hierarchy, that the textbook is some kind of truth being handed over to them, that uh, even when we show movies in class, you know, if we hand kids a worksheet, and they watch a film and they're to pull information from the movie to fill in a worksheet, that's reinforcing a knowledge hierarchy. The kids presume that the movie must be accurate because the teacher chose to show it and we're in fact using it to pull information from the movie. Notice we haven't problematized the movie. We haven't, we haven't challenged kids to question the movie. We simply show it. And if we do that, we reinforce this knowledge hierarchy. But that teachers hold answers, textbooks hold answers, and I want to suggest to you we need to problematize the classroom so that kids see us as a community of thinkers, a knowledge network where we want to explore complex issues. And to do that, notice in the center, if you can kind of peer through the, the, the circle there, we launch with provocations that invite thinking. And I want to show you what that might look like uh, in just a moment. So we're going to move on from this. But I want to suggest, by the way, I should say one other thing. Um, in the, in the work we do in the Critical Thinking Consortium, uh, we're not big fans of Bloom's Taxonomy. And my guess is many of you learned about Bloom's Taxonomy in your teacher training and were expected to use Bloom's Taxonomy uh, to frame your questions. And, and I just want to take a moment. Uh, and by the way, I suspect, I, I don't know if any of you are, are in your first five years. Anyone in the first five years of teaching? Let me ask those of you, <laughs> I wish, uh, those of you here in your first few years of teaching, are you still learning Bloom's taxonomy when you're in your teacher training? Is it still kind of foundational? Yeah, this is uh, so beautiful. Uh, back in the day, first year in June, and, and yes, Bloom's taxonomy continu continues to be a heavy influence. Uh, what you need to understand is Bloom's taxonomy was created as a way to think about our assessments, that when we're framing assessment uh, you know, test items and so on, that we're considering the cognitive demands of the question. That, that, that 
you know, framed a certain way, it's a recall or it's an analysis or it's an evaluative question. Um, Bloom created this as an assessment kind of typology or a way to think about our assessments. We've tended to adopt it over the last 60 years as a pedagogical approach or a pedagogical tool. So we'll talk about high and low order thinking and we'll presume that, and by the way, Bloom said this and we buy into this, that we have to work from the content up, that we first teach content to remember. If you look at the bottom of the 2001 taxonomy, remembering is at the bottom, evaluating is near the top, creating at the very top. I want to suggest to you that, that thinking is in everything we do with kids. Teaching content for remembering is what many of you were opposed to. Let me give you just a very quick uh, example of where I, I see this as problematic. Our achievement chart in the province. Our achievement chart, notice we separate knowledge and understanding from thinking. We separate communication from thinking. We separate application from thinking. Sorry, my Natasha, can you hear me? I just want to, I just, yeah, I can't hear you. I just want to make sure my mic isn't off. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, so notice in our achievement chart, we isolate thinking as one of four things that we want to measure. But I've yet to have a teacher tell me how you could possibly assess understanding without kids being engaged in thinking. I don't, I don't know how you could assess quality communication without kids thinking about purpose and audience, without thinking about the, what underpins. I, I have had teachers for years ask me, I don't, what's the difference between application and thinking? Don't you have to think to apply? So notice uh, what we've done though in the province using Bloom as an underpinning, we've made thinking one of four different goals. I would suggest to you that thinking should infu be infused across all the other goals. Knowledge and understanding at a level one, you can recall some of the information, but by a level four, you're able to select relevant and useful information to solve the problem. A level one communication, you can communicate with some clarity uh, your position, but a level four, you, you show great clarity and a clear understanding of purpose and audience. But notice what I'm doing here, saying thinking is the quality that we want. It's what determines the quality of the work. It's not isolated as a separate piece, but with Bloom's taxonomy, uh, we tend to do that. Uh, Diane, I don't know. I, I think it'd be wonderful if we did have a change that would recognize, by the way, if the ministries look at the report card, uh, I'd love if they would come and chat uh, with us in the consortium or chat and have the chat with me, that we could rethink if you truly want to value creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, then we've got to stop making thinking one of several goals and say, no, thinking is the foundation upon which we build all the other learning and it should be infused across. Now, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I do want to make the case that, that thinking is foundational. It's why content can't be taught in the absence of thinking. Uh, that everything we do should invite them. Now, I'm going to layer that into this, this slide. Uh, I, you know, I, I like this visual. It, it does a nice job of, of getting us to think about inquiry and different forms of inquiry. Uh, so on the left, you'll see structured inquiry, where the teacher leads the whole class through one inquiry together. We can go to controlled inquiry, where teacher defines the topics and the students work to answer the questions. We can go to guided inquiry where, where students select from a list of topics but are able to design their own product or solution to that response. Or we can go to free inquiry where students pick their topics without being restricted by, by a prescribed outcome, or in, sorry, any prescribed outcomes or curriculum of any kind. I'm showing you this. Uh, by the way, that, that's a nice kind of summary of, of different types of inquiry. What I want to suggest to you, I could do any one of those four types of inquiry and not involve kids in critical thinking. So I want you to just take a moment and look at those. Can you imagine that any one of those inquiries could be done without necessarily involving students in critical thinking? Let's just give you a minute to, to read them through and see if you agree with my statement that any one of those can be done without necessarily kids being good thinkers. So 
So let me pick up on a couple of things that I'm seeing. Um, I saw a question that I absolutely agree. There is a move to um, to releasing responsibility over to the students. However, as someone else noted, if I'm doing free inquiry in which I simply gather a bunch of information, stick it on the display board, and hand it in. By the way, keep in mind to inquire. To inquire is is to seek answers. So. At free inquiry, I could do that in a way that I make no judgments. I don't filter my sources as credible or not. I just find some information, I gather it, I stick it on a board. I want to tell you at the other end, structured inquiry could have the you know, teacher handing over information. I'm suggesting to you that any one of these can be done in a critically thoughtless way, and any one of these can be done in a critically thoughtful way. Free inquiry could engage kids in good, rich thinking if they know how to ask good, critically thoughtful questions, if they know how to use criteria to guide their decisions. Uh, Jane, when you write that critical thinking is in all of them, I think the potential is there for all of them, but as is the potential for all of them to be just gathering and regurgitating information. So my point is this. Sometimes I think we have to be careful that we don't presume that if I turn control completely over to kids, that now I have more thinking going on in my class. I, I don't necessarily. In fact, discovery learning in math has not gone that well, either here or Alberta, because if kids don't have the tools, they don't have the mathematical reasoning that we've helped them to, to acquire, they're still going to struggle. I want to wrap around this whole visual a critical inquiry lens. I want to wrap around all of these, regardless of whether it's a teacher directed or a student directed. I don't care. Are we engaging kids in meaningful questions are we teaching kids the intellectual tools they need to go deep in their learning? And that's what tonight is going to be about, is how do we ensure whatever form of inquiry, wherever we are in that release. By the way, notice, I don't care where I'm in gradual release. I want kids engaged in thinking. So when I do release them completely, they know how to frame provocative questions. They know how to gather credible research. They know how to make thoughtful decisions. And so all of these forms can be rich opportunities for critical thinking they can also uh, be simply gathering information. So let me show you an example of what I mean by this. Inquiry is research. If I asked, uh, and, and there's a situation where you know, people are you know, deciding how to get to a taco cart to get lunch, which would be the fastest route. If I do it as inquiry as research, I simply ask, how did each one get to the, get to the taco cart? It's surface, I can look it up, it's recalling information, but I don't have to make a thoughtful decision. Uh, if I ask, do you prefer to answer questions that have correct answers or for which there's more than one answer? That's a preference question. There's no wrong answers. It's again surface. If I were to ask, what are all the different routes that, that Dan or Ben could have taken to get to the taco card? There could be new ideas and connections. You could generate new ideas, but I haven't asked you to make a judgment. I just asked you to think of all the different possibilities. But if I ask you to offer a sound conjecture, who is most likely to get there the fastest? You'd have to be able to apply what you know, your conceptual understandings, to arrive at a sound conjecture. So what I'm just trying to show in that is all of these are opportunities for inquiry, but one is simply looking up and one is offering preferences, and one is inviting a judgment to be made. And, and uh, let me show you one more example. This is the Gibraltar airport. Let's see if anyone... Um, by the way, I'm going to tell you right now, if you Google the Gibraltar airport, the first hits you're going to get are going to be why it's one of the world's top, uh, most frightening airports, uh, why the Gibraltar airport is one of the most poorly designed. Uh, taking a close look at the picture, could a few of you just, what's wrong with the Gibraltar airport? Why does it get so much uh, disrespect from, from travelers who travel to? What's wrong? Yeah, exactly. Those are the only runway in Gibraltar cuts across the only major road in Gibraltar. So whenever a plane lands or takes off, cars you can see at the bottom stop and wait for the plane to take off. The pedestrians you can see kind of middle-ish to left. You see them waiting. They wait, and then they can cross the road and traffic flows again. So here are four ways I could approach this, this topic. Inquiry is research. You know, go online and find out what you can about the history of Gibraltar and its airport. That would be research. You come back, I found out this about Gibraltar, I found this out about the airport. Notice that doesn't ask me to make a judgment of any kind. It simply asks me to do some research. 
I could say go find out interesting facts. What do you find interesting? That would be a preference. I could ask why might Gibraltar have been built in a way so that insects brainstorm. Why, why might they do this? Again, that generates novel ideas, but it doesn't necessarily generate a judgment. Right? Notice the last one. Is the Gibraltar airport an example of poor planning or innovative problem solving? Okay. Now I'm asking you to make a judgment. And I want you to note, however, I was putting this together and a, and a student on a flight sitting beside me looked over my shoulder and he said, oh, definitely poor planning. And I said, are you sure? He said, oh yeah, this is definitely poor planning. So I said, tell me what you know about Gibraltar. He said, not much. I said, okay, but you're, but you're sure it's poor planning? He said, yeah. I said, okay, well, let me tell you a couple of things about Gibraltar. On the right, the picture on the right, Gibraltar is this tip, you know, on the southern coast of Spain. From the tip you see at the bottom of the image, up top you will see, if I can draw a highlighter here, this is the border with Spain here, and the runway that we were looking at, just, oops, sorry, just give me one second, the runway that we were looking at, what's that? is here. So you need to build a runway. The British, oh, by the way, this is a British territory taken over in 1713 under the War of Spanish Succession. So this is now owned by Britain, but until about 15 years ago, the Spanish would not allow you to cross from Spain into Gibraltar, and the British need a way in, so they needed to build a railway, and it had to be, or sorry, a, a runway, and it had to be somewhere from this narrow tip to the border that I've shown you up top here. And then we said, I said to the student, and you might also think about this thing called the rock of Gibraltar that is, that is sitting over here, because you got that thing in the way. So let me ask you, if you would please, if you think this is such bad planning, and I said to the student, so this is bad planning, what are some alternatives? So if you think crossing the road is not a good idea, what could you do instead? So could a few of you just, just take a moment and, and type in some alternatives to having a roadway cross. By the way, you can see in the picture on the left, you can see the roadway where it crosses coming out of the, the, the city and then across there. What can we do instead? See if a few of you can offer a few suggestions. Okay, Trevor, great, like Hong Kong, you know, build, uh, build out onto the water, extend it and create it that way. What else? Ferries. Um, build out into the water and a, uh, and so I'm, I'm assuming, uh, Brian, when you're saying, so perhaps take that road and wrap it out around the the runway, okay? Yeah, a little bit is built on the water. Create an underpass, so tunnel under it instead, okay? Let me add a little bit to your knowledge of Gibraltar. These are the total number of flights. You can see on uh, Friday, June 17th, 2016, there's the total number of flights in and out of Gibraltar in a single day. So what do we see? There's three, six, you know, eight flights in, eight flights out. Not the busiest airport in the world. Let me ask you, uh, these options that you've given, how much would that tunnel cost? <laughs> I love that suggestion, free snack. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be millions of dollars to build that tunnel, billions, I'm sure, to build that, that island airport. Uh, it's a very expensive proposition. So what if I ask kids, um, and here's some options you've considered. Considering the following criteria, what would be the best solution? It needs to be the least disruptive, it needs to be cost efficient, and it needs, needs to be safe and practical for pilots. By the way, from a science lens, this is an interesting question, because you have to take into account winds, winds coming off the water, that you can't just put it anywhere. So you have to be able to land the plane in a safe way. Joyce, great questions as well. What's the population of Gibraltar? How many people are actually disrupted? Does it actually in, impact their economic flow? These are all wonderful questions, but the point I want you to see in this, when I first show you the slide and I say, is this poor planning um, or innovative problem solving? Unless you know something about Gibraltar, its history, its population today, you can't make a thoughtful decision on that question we can look at it and just decide they made poor planning judgments. Perhaps it's the most thoughtful decision. So unless I build your background knowledge, you can't make a thoughtful decision. I want to make that point. Here I problematize the image instead of just assuming 
that it's a bad planning. How about we gather some evidence, we develop some criteria to help us think. So this is all to set up uh, as we move in towards the, uh, the, the key focus tonight. We should see inquiry as a stance. Uh, I, I would suggest to you that we want to be careful. You know, sometimes we, we, you'll see people writing or talking about uh, inquiry-based learning. Right? So IBL classrooms or we're in an inquiry-based school. I want to suggest to you that inquiry is more of a stance than a particular method of learning. Because used well, it can infuse problem-based learning, project-based learning, case-based learning, discovery learning, direct instruction. All of them can take an inquiry stance. Notice I said when we're working in Peru, uh, they are working on a project-based and a play-based infusion, and they're looking at how do we add critical thinking to support the kids. So notice what I, what I want to do is I want to make inquiry a stance of learning, not an approach to learning. And I want to marry it to almost any other approach, just inviting kids to think, and, and, and in particular, a critically thoughtful approach. So I, I said to you earlier, and I'll, I'll re reiterate this to, to draw us to a close here, my job is not to teach answers. In, in traditional approach, you know, textbooks, uh, lectures, whatever, we teach answers, and kids see their job. Um, as the, their job is to remember it. Versus a critical thinking approach, my job isn't to teach you the answer to the questions. Your job is to figure out a reasonable answer. My job is to help you build the tools to do it successfully. So there's a shift from, I don't know the answer to the question whether Gibraltar, I'm not going to teach you that Gibraltar has or hasn't made a good decision. I'm going to help build your background so you can draw your own conclusion and we can have a range of possible answers. Uh, Diana, can I define a stance as an approach? Uh, I, I suppose I could. What I'm trying to say there is um, in, sometimes we, we kind of, like direct instruction has a set of seven steps you go through. So that's, you know, it's a structured approach. And what I'm saying is inquiry can be infused through that, that seven-step structure. Uh, Project-based learning has a, a, you know, we're going to ground learning by having kids engage in creating meaningful projects. Well, I can, I can do that where kids just build something, or I can do that in which I, I use a critical inquiry approach to how they're going to build something. So what I'm getting at is I believe critical inquiry can be added to any other um, framework, if you want, or approach that we use. And one last piece. When I, you know, you've been hearing me say throughout the evening that we want to put thinking at the core of learning, that it should be infused in everything we do. And what I want you to do is think about, because I think we need to be thoughtful about what I would call big C critical thinking or little c critical thinking. Big C critical thinking is probably what, what we're most comfortable with. It's the projects. You know, it's the, it's the rich task that kids have to put a lot of effort and thought into. It's something that takes uh, uh, place over a few weeks or a unit. It's, it's the big stuff. And by the way, I think those are, are hugely important and, and engaging. But I want to suggest to you that kids will not be as successful in the big C if we don't pay attention to the little C. Little C, what do I do on a daily basis that could take five minutes, uh, that is infused in, on a daily, that routine, thinking becomes routine. My worry when we have big C only in the absence of little C, kids still see learning as a place where primarily they come and information exists or answers exist in text or teacher uh, dictates the answers. I want kids to see when you walk in here every day, thinking is what we do, which leads us to this more complex understanding. So here's an example, and then we're starting to move into what I'll call the structures. And I've been playing with this notion of a baloney meter, where I would ask students, I want you to take a look at something. Okay. So for example, uh, and this is going to be a controversial one. Should I show Pocahontas in a grade five class? And the typical answer is going to be no. It's 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 sexist. It's 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 uh, inaccurate. It it, uh, it perpetuates uh, stereotypes. And I want to suggest you, but maybe that's what I need kids to to see. Notice if I say I will, I I'm deeming this to be a poor film, and I'm deeming this one to be a good film. I'm doing the thinking. I've made the judgment. What if I showed kids the first 10 minutes of Pocahontas? And I asked them, uh, by the way, those of you, some of you I noticed when, when asked uh, your, your area of teaching, 
uh, I had a number of you in that case, kind of grade three to five, six. If you're teaching kids in that, you know, grade three to six range, and you show them the first ten minutes of Pocahontas and said, do you think this movie has no baloney? It, it's a very accurate portrayal. Do you think it's a little baloney? It, it's mostly accurate, but, but some things are wrong. Do you think there's a lot of baloney in that? It's full of baloney. Where would kids, where would they be on my scale from no baloney to full of baloney? I'm just going to give you a minute. Just, uh, what do you think? I'm, I remember, no pre-teaching. I walk in, I show 10 minutes, and I say, where would you put this on my scale? What would they say? So notice many of you are saying a little baloney, but for the most part. Now, what if every day that I taught a lesson, we invited an elder, we read indigenous literature, we began to look at, and I asked kids, what do you guys think now? Do you think? So notice what I'm trying to do is I don't want to make the decision. I won't show this because I have deemed it to be bad history. I want kids to reach that conclusion. By the way, I have the same thing I, I do with Jurassic Park. Where, is, where would you place Jurassic Park in terms of the science underlying how they extracted the DNA uh, out of the fossils and, and created dinosaurs. Is that really good science? There's no baloney. That, that's, that's, that's good science. Is that a lot of baloney? Is that full of baloney? Asking kids the first day and say, okay, well, let's go explore the science behind the movie now. And you tell me whether the movie, as we move along, man, this, this movie is, is, is a lot more full of baloney than I thought. Or maybe I'm surprised. Wow, there's actually more good science in there than I realized. Notice what, what I want to do um, is I want to get kids starting to use this every day in my class. As you learn, I'll invite you to go back to this question and see if you've changed your mind at all. Or this is my high school version where we use a crap detector. And we just invite kids to think about, um, oh, Natasha, thanks for that. A book on the, the, the science of Jurassic Park, right? Uh, with a crap detector, we, we invite kids to, to think about uh, how true do you think the source is. By the way, earlier I talked to you about problematizing. I want you to think about this. Um, I want kids just to open up your textbook because I said to you earlier, I think too often kids assume the text is true. So I want to problematize it. Take out your text. We're going to be reading and we're going to be working through the next, this is the chapter with a partner, flip through it, look at, you know, subheadings, pictures, key ideas, and tell me if you think the textbook seems like a really sound, it seems really solid, it's true, it seems pretty reasonable, there might be some errors. What if as we work through the unit, kids are invited, okay, do you still think this is a sound? By the way, I don't care if you end up in the unit saying, I thought it was true, and now I can prove it's true, this is good, solid stuff. Or what if I said, you know what? I thought this was true, but I've realized there are voices missing. I realize there's a perspective shared, but another one absent. I want to dial this over to some red flags. And by the way, when kids say, well, I've got some red flags, I think this is, this is problematic. Good. Write me two sections you could add to this chapter that would help dial it back towards the green. Notice what I'm doing is saying you don't assume that your text is true because someone handed it to you. Uh, Natasha, good point. In this, in this era of fake news, how do we know what to trust? How do we know this, this rings true? Who's the source? How credible is the source? Does this align with other sources tell me? By the way, both of these things I'm showing are what I'm referring to as structures. No sound. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, thanks. Both of these are what I mean by structures, because notice what I can do is I can put out my, my baloney meter the first day. By the way, I'm physically seeing uh, a large baloney meter on a wall with a sliding arm on it, uh, and kids have to slide along that. And each day as they learn, we pause and we say, given what you've learned today, anyone think we should shift our baloney meter? Why do you think that? Same thing here. This dial, physically, I would want to create a large one, put it on my wall with a you know, Brad's clip and, and have a, a, a dial to spin. Come and set the dial where you think it would go based on what you know now. As we do an experiment, watch a video, do a reading, listen to a lecture, given the new learning you've done, how would you change this and why? By the way, my ticket out the door could be, uh, as you learn, okay, at the end of the class, I'm going to give you a cue card, a sticky note, and I want you to cite two pieces of evidence you can take from today's lesson and go up and place that. If you think that helps prove the chapter is solid or true, put it over there. If you think this raises an issue, put it over here. So getting kids just to either of these every day, by the way, notice thinking is now embedded in my class, even if it's a, a content delivery lesson, you're thinking about that content. 
And the other piece I, I want to set up is just the, the making learning as, as real, real. I'm not going to spend much time here because tonight I want to get to the, to the other pieces. So let me jump by this, uh, and we can always return if we have time. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a little context because th what this could be is a whole different webinar if, if it kind of resonates with you. I, I created this to be thinking about our assessments. And notice my, my line in the middle is looking at degrees of authenticity, moving learning from what I call fake, fake to real, real. Uh, down in the bottom left corner, this is my fake, fake area. Um, I would argue writing tests for most kids are fake, fake. When I say fake, fake, the one fake is the product or performance. That what you're asking me to do has no connection to the world beyond the classroom. It's, it's, it's um, you know, it's something school makes you do, but you don't do it in life. So it's, it, in the kid's mind, this isn't authentic in terms. But the other fake is the, uh, the vertical axis. Who is the purpose or audience? Who am I sharing this work with? Am I just handing it in for the teacher to mark and hand it back? Or am I doing something that actually has an authentic audience beyond the classroom? Now notice my, my green square is saying this is fake real learning. And what do I mean by fake real? Uh, you've got an authentic audience beyond the classroom, but what you're asking me to do is still assemble information in a report that I would do that is not necessarily authentic. It's got a real audience. It just doesn't have a real uh, authentic task. Over in the, uh, I don't know what color that is, kind of yellowish, uh, notice that's, that's fake real in terms of um, you've got a real task, a nice authentic task, but it's still the teacher is the only one who sees it. And what I want to be doing is playing in the blue area where kids are not only creating authentic uh, tasks, they're sharing them with an authentic audience. And so the idea, like I put School of Rock up here because if you remember the movie, uh, I think it's um, a really interesting, like not the best teacher in the world, but School of Rock is about a real concert that really matters, all the kids are involved in. So I want, I want to play in this blue area where we think about what can I get kids to do that they will find meaningful and authentic, and who can I get them to share it with? And I'm seeing some comments, you know, online experience. Just, you know, thinking of the opportunity to blog, to share this with others. Uh, by the way, I mentioned that Peru, I want to just bring it back again. In, in Alberta, Peru is, is part of their curriculum in grade three. So I'm talking to them in Peru saying, well, let's get our kids working on climate change together. So the kids in Peru will send stuff and you'll send stuff. Out. Like what if we got our grade twos who look at different cultures around the world actually creating work that will be sent to the children in Peru to help the children in Peru learn about them and vice versa. Like what if we made, made the learning or, or Virginia so the assemblies being real, real. You have an audience to perform for. So what if we, we got, uh, by the way, those of you who teach kindergarten, you just have to invite the principal in, and, and that just changes things for kids. It just it gives them an authentic audience. As I said, I think this could be a whole webinar in of itself, just how do we make learning uh, real for kids. But uh, So we'll move on from that. This is a real quick uh, summary, just because I want to shift so we don't run out of time. If you haven't done work with us in critical thinking, this is an important reminder. When we talk about critical thinking, Critical thinking is not to be critical. It is not to criticize. It is to make thoughtful decisions or you know, reasoned judgments using criteria. It comes from the Greek word meaning criteria. So, so all critical thinking is making thoughtful decisions um, using criteria as a basis. So I'm going to just quickly show you to, to cue this up. Notice on the left, I, I, this four battles that occurred in World War II. That is not a critical thinking question. I can look them up. I can retrieve them from my memory. Uh, I can remember you told me them yesterday. This is, this is memory. Assemble evidence about the infusion of technology in classrooms. For many kids, okay, I'll go find evidence. I'll write it down. But they're not filtering it. Add a title to your story. Uh, you know, uh, okay, my story, what I did this summer. Just as a reminder, notice here, List for significant battles that occurred during World War II is a critical thinking question. You'll notice my title on the slide. It's not the verb that matters. My verb hasn't changed here. List, assemble, add. They're the same on both sides, but the right are critical thinking invitations, the left are not. Notice the difference isn't adding a why question or changing the verb. It's adding a qualifier. Significant, credible, and relevant, effective. 
that requires kids now pause and think about, well, what would make one battle more significant than another? Why would I pick this battle over this? Using, as I said earlier, criteria to help me make a decision. What's your criteria for an effective title? How do you know a source is credible? What criteria could we use? So notice it's adding in the qualifier that creates the invitation to think. And this uh, wheel of qualifiers, and, and some of you I know uh, have been in sessions with me before, so you've seen this many times. This is an attempt just to help teachers out by saying, here are at least a starting point of the kind of qualifiers that I can uh, drop in almost any question you know, in a textbook, in the curriculum that's currently not actually a good critical thinking question. And by adding uh, one more word, I can turn into a critical thinking question. So for example, identify two arguments the author makes. Identify the two most compelling arguments the author makes. Notice by adding that word compelling, we have to pause, think about our criteria, we have to make judgments. Was it fair for the little red hen not to share her bread? Okay. Why did the little red hen not share her bread is a recall question. Was it fair that she chose not to share her bread? Hmm, well, what's my criteria for fair? Right. So I want you to note by simply dropping in one of these words in the questions, I can often tweak them and make them a critical thinking question. Notice how quickly it took me a matter of seconds. I didn't have to completely overhaul. And another uh, uh, webinar that I do, and I'm just touching on this very briefly, is using this idea of a cascade. So this is, this is just meant to be a really quick uh, setting up an inquiry, because this is going to set up our, our, our structures. Um, you know, looking at, this is what we did with grade five. So First Nations, a benefit for interactions with Europeans. Well, what do you mean by benefit? We identify some criteria. Uh, if you're familiar, I'll just put the name in here. Jane Yolen is the author of a book called Encounters. Some of you may be familiar with it. So I'm typing Jane Encounters. Um, Jane Yolen uh, wrote a book called Encounters, which tells the story of the arrival of Columbus to the Americas in the Caribbean, but through the eyes of a young Taino boy, an indigenous child, uh, in the Caribbean, who sees the arrival of, of these sea monsters, as he calls them, as they arrive. At them. And the story tells the impact of Columbus's arrival on the Taino people. And in the, uh, the last page, the young boy is now 70 years old, and he's reflecting back on, on what the arrival of Europeans have, have meant to have, or, or impact, how they've impacted on his people. So we would read this story with the children in, in grade five, for example. Their challenge is going to be to write a new version of Encounters, but set in Canada. So they have to take the, the model that Jane Yolen has set up, and notice, to break this down and make it manageable, we're going to explore early contact, and then we're going to look at the fur trade. So focus inquiry one, over the next week, we're going to examine this. Then we're going to look at fur trade, then we're going to look at the impact of colonization, and as we look at each section, you're going to be thinking about our big question, how, were they being helped or harmed, you're going to gather evidence, and you're going to write another two-page spread illustrated for your book. Notice your book is growing with each inquiry, and in the end, the kids will have written a 8- or 10- or 12-page book. But instead of teaching all of the material and saying, okay, now that we've finished our look at European arrival and its impact on, on Indigenous people, now reach back over the last month of learning and write a story about it, we're having the kids learn incrementally, learn a little, Start framing a response here, polish it, set it aside, we're going to move on to the next piece. So I wanted to show you that as we call this a cascade, and some of you have worked with them, putting our, our rich question up front, putting the challenge up front, and then getting kids to, in an iterative way, keep returning to it, revisiting and going deeper. So another example, I've tried to put examples in across, uh, across subjects. This was done in uh, a grade 10 science class looking at energy, and the children are asked, uh, which slide, this one, you know, which, which one's going to be the most exciting? In fact, this, which one's going to be the fastest? And whenever I ask people, people are going to say the one on the right. right? But Justine, you're right, the one on the left is actually faster. And what the kids start to learn as they learn the science is that each dip in that slide on the left is an energy conversion. It's picking up speed as it goes. It will actually overtake the one on the right. Now, the challenge for the kids, they had to design the most exciting ride they could 
they would be invited the very first day, draw me the slide you think you would build. Every day you learn a new science lesson, you're going to go back to your design and see would you change something about your slide? How will you ensure it's stable? How will you ensure that the ending of your ride is safe and exhilarating? How will you make sure you're getting the highest speed? How, you know, how do you create the funnest ride possible? So notice the, the process here. Kids start drawing out their, their slide. They change it every time they learn. Now, this sets me all up for the piece that, that I really need to get to, the structures that are going to help kids. So what I've tried to set up there, I want to invite kids to, to, to be thinking critically. I want them to sustain that thinking over time. I want them to have an iterative process that allows them to revisit their initial thoughts, decide what changes they should make, what additions they would add to it, or in times to say, I was right and I have more evidence why. So this is where I want to show you some of the structures now. And again, I've put a range in across. So you're going to see a variety, I, I hope, and, and we're going to pause and maybe think about it. This was in a, a family studies uh, course looking at families and, and, and in fact, uh, the criteria I've list, listed here for a healthy family are taken right out of the curriculum, just tweaked a little bit. Uh, the Simpsons, healthier dysfunctional family. Well, how would we decide if a family is, is a healthy family? These are the criteria suggested by the curriculum that uh, a healthy family provides a, 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 a space for physical, emotional, social, spiritual needs of the family, that it sensitive to the needs of the members. They listen and communicate effectively. This is what effective families do. As we learn about, by the way, what you'll see here, and again, I'm less interested in what the particular topic here. I want you to notice the structure, because this whole talk tonight is the structures. This is a evidence for and against chart. So I'm just reading, um, Yeah, this is, I'm sorry, I'm just it's, I'm reading uh, uh, the comment about uh, what us um, as teachers uh, aware of our bias and provide information that presents the perspectives. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, if I could just expand on that, one of the things I often will see, and I saw it today in working with some teachers, when we frame a question that embeds the answer, it, it, it plays to these biases. So sometimes I'll see questions, um, let me show you an example here. Um, in what ways were the, are the Simpsons a healthy family? Well, there I'm telling you what you need to believe. Notice I want to open this up and then providing that range of, of options for to consider. I, I'm not here to give you the answer. I am here to get you to have to think about. And notice as I uh, have you do a reading, uh, watch a video, um, do a lecture, however we engage in this learning, instead of writing traditional linear notes, Kids are organizing that information under the four criteria, the five criteria we've identified, and does this evidence show that the criteria was or was not being met? Let me show you another same example so, you, so you'll get the idea in a history class. Was Henry VIII the ideal Renaissance prince or was he a royal scoundrel? An ideal Renaissance prince, this is according to the Book of the Courtier, is well-versed in the arts, skilled in the art of war, physically adept, has excellent social skills and graces, is knowledgeable and intelligent. You'll notice I've taken the same set of criteria, listed them down the side. As we now learn about the Tudor period in my history class, I want you to gather evidence that Henry did or did not meet each of these criteria. By the way, you may have one or two points that it was met and four points it wasn't met. On the right, you're making a judgment around each of the criteria, so I think it was somewhat limited. How well does it meet the criteria? In the end, I can make an overall judgment in relation to this question. Now, uh, I'm going to just, uh, I think, I, yeah, I'm going to come back to this one. I'm going to pause for a moment. I wanted to, I mean, I've got these for you know, grade one where I ask kids, is this a caring community? We have, so just replace Henry VIII. What makes a caring, you know, is this a caring community? Are we a caring community? We have three criteria in grade one for a caring community. Uh, by the way, by definition, communities are places where, and I'll just kind of type these, um, where people interact. So a room full of 30 people who aren't talking with each other is not a community. Communities are places where people interact. Communities are places where uh, 
people help each other to meet their needs. So the interactions are helping meet each other's needs. And a caring community is a place that is respectful, that we are respectful of each other. So remember, this is grade one. So imagine if I said to kids, okay, so a caring community, we would see people interacting in a way that helps each other meet their needs and do it in a respectful way. Let's read a story. Let's gather evidence in our school. What evidence can you find that our school is a caring community? Was there any evidence that it was not? So maybe a child noticed some bullying one day. That would be evidence that we're not acting in a respectful way. So they would match that evidence to that. And they would gather, and, and you might say, and so do we get an A plus as a caring community, which would mean all of our evidence is, is supporting? Do we get an A because most of it was, but we had a few missteps? Are we more of a B community because we've got some work to do? Notice, so I'm getting kids to weigh the evidence in light of criteria is it being met or not met? So I just want to pause for a moment and ask, can you think of a topic that you could take the same idea, drop Henry VIII from my title, put something else in. Uh, I'll give you one other example. You know, we have this for Louis, uh, for Louis Riel. How should history judge? Is, is he a great heroic figure or not? We have our criteria for a hero. As you learn about what evidence are you finding that he was in fact or perhaps did not or somewhere in between. Uh, so. Let me just pause for a moment. Can anyone think of another topic that we could use an evidence for and against charge? And by the way, remember this is for ongoing each day as I teach a new lesson, as kids read some more material, they gather evidence and they decide is this more evidence that it was or was not being met. Oh, lovely. Which is more likely to influence child success, parenting or education? So we would look at our criteria what is key to ensuring child success. Uh, I would probably then want two pages, one for parenting, one for school, to gather evidence about the impact and they weigh them. Can oh, interesting, Deanna. Uh, so evidence that this is or is not a, quadru a quadrilateral uh, is truly doing a good job. But what's our criteria for a prime minister to be doing an effective job? What evidence do you have he is or is not meeting the criteria? Wonderful. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Uh, how fair was that Canada's immigration? What's our criteria for fair immigration policy? What evidence can you assemble that we were meeting the criteria? What evidence is or we were not meeting the criteria? By the way, notice this is not meant to be a binary question. So the answer is not it is or is not fair. It's going to be a matter of degree. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 we had the gold standard for immigration, the model that everyone should follow, uh, 1 being it was a disaster and an embarrassment. Where would you put it? And kids might say, you know, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. We had some highlights. We had some setbacks. Overall, I'd give it this score. So what we want to do is make sure that these are not binary questions, but invite kids uh, to make a judgment. Oh, Joanna, I love you. Uh, you guys have such good questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we build criteria, uh, but it doesn't mean uh, criteria is never fixed. Uh, best example I can give you, if I ask you what's your criteria, let me just try this out. Uh, what's your criteria for an effective leader? We asked is, 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 um, is Trudeau doing a good job? What, 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 what makes someone an effective leader? Let me just see if you could jot a couple down. Okay, so they're charismatic. Give me another one. They're responsive, okay? They have clear goals. By the way, let me stop on those ones because you're, you're, I like where your other ones are going. If I took the ones, ability to communicate, charismatic, clear goals, I would argue Adolf Hitler hits all of those. But notice when some of you started to put down empathy, a sense of justice, oh, he doesn't. So what if, if my class had built criteria for an effective leader around charisma, um, a clear vision for the future, they have clear goals, they're able to motivate people. I have to say Hitler meets all of those, but when you add compassion, uh, value for human life, so would my criteria evolve over time? Yeah, I might pause and go, wait a minute, there's something missing here because a mass murderer should not be deemed to be an effective leader. I wonder if I'm missing something in my criteria that I, I need to rethink. So 
Uh, I, I think, you know, criteria can evolve um, as we Let me show you another structure, and again, I want to play out. Um, if I ask students, this, this is using a ranking ladder. So we say to kids, uh, we're looking at climate change. Here are six factors impacting climate change, all true. All of these are factors impacting climate change, but they're not all equally important. I want you to keep in mind, I'm saying this is day one. You walk into my class, the ranking ladder you see on, my, on the screen here, for me this would be a large ranking ladder on the wall, you know, five feet high. Notice there are five rungs, and I've got six factors impacting climate change, each of them on a laminated piece of paper. And kids have to put them in order. Day one, talk with your group, decide what would go on the top, second, third, fourth, fifth rung. What would kids put? Let's say we're doing this in grade nine geography. What would kids put on the top rung? Which of these six factors is having the biggest impact on climate change? Okay, so cars, we're going to put out number one. What's number two? Wait, give me a second one now. I see cars, maybe you agree. Volcanoes, heating homes. By the way, notice what kids are doing is they're putting them in order. I've done no pre-teaching. This is my diagnostic. I want to see what you guys think. I might ask you, can you explain why you put them in this? Is it, are you guessing? Um, is it from based on your experience? Did you read something? Okay. Now, oh, I see cowspiracy. Is that <laughs> dealing with the, the, the impact of cows? By the way, I told you these are all true. And kids put them in order. Why do I have five rungs? but six options to consider. One of the key things in critical thinking uh, is, is constraint theory. By giving you five rungs, but six things to consider, you have to decide which one you're leaving off. You, you can't put them all on, and I want them in order. Now, I would give kids another sheet. I have it here just to show you. This is a different topic, the same idea. There's a ranking ladder. There are choices on the, on the right at the top there. Kids put them in order. They explain why they think that. Every day I teach a lesson now. This is a structure for thinking. Every day I teach, whether it's just a reading I provide, a video I show, a short lecture I deliver, kids have to think about the content just delivered. Does that impact your order? Would you change your ordering now? So it might be in my classroom we begin to rearrange maybe the one we left off. We now think, actually, this is a bigger deal than I thought. It should go on. As soon as you want to put it on, something else has to come off. So kids have this ongoing, this is what I mean by an iterative approach. Day one, they put up the five in the order they think is most important or biggest factor contributing. But as they work through the unit, they're continually being invited to decide, do you think you still have it right? Do you think we should shift it? Why do you think you should shift it? By the way, notice here, as kids alter their order, they have to provide evidence but I want you to know, even if a child said, no, I think my order is right yesterday, I'm not changing it, fine, you can leave it exactly the same, but you have to give me more reasons. Out of today's lesson, give me three more pieces of evidence you would use to support that you were right and that you don't need to shift it. I am not as interested in whether or not you're, you know, do you have the correct order? I care about the quality of evidence that you've built to support your order. Can I, again, pause and, and I see if we can get a few examples where could you use a ranking ladder? So unlike my other one, what could you do in which kids would be given a, a variety of things to consider and they have to put them in order from most powerful, most significant uh, to least? Let me some other examples. So I've given you two, uh, impact and climate change or options that would be the best way to conserve water. What would be some others? I oh, love it. Green chemistry, significant events in World War II, this is coming fast. Um, global issues, oh, that's a good one, eh? Um, here are six issues we can't get involved in all of them. How do we decide? How do we budget? What should be our top priorities? These are great suggestions. Um, social justice issues, the most pressing to be addressed. Um, by the way, notice all of these are saying here are five important issues. We have time to address three of them. Which three would you pick? As you learn about them, you see their impact. Would anyone change the three you've picked? Beautiful. 
Oh, interesting. Romeo and Juliet. Who's the most responsible, most culpable? As you study it, how would you change it? Love it. Okay, so lots of ideas here. Uh, by the way, just to say, because these come up fast and furious, uh, uh, Mally, just uh, want to confirm, this will get sent out, uh, right, that people could always go back through, listen to a game, or uh, look at all these different suggestions. Am I right? Um, you, if you could, I could add it as a PDF, um, but um, we just, as long as you're comfortable with that, sure. Um, I'm sorry, Mally, I didn't hear. I don't know if there was something if others did. Yeah, and I as long as I saw your name come up, but I didn't hear a response. Yeah, as long as uh, you're comfortable with uh, sharing, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'll just have to convert I'm everything. Sharing, Mally, I'm not. I'm not getting anything. I, you should. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? You, uh, Tracy can hear me. Okay. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm pretty sure uh, that OTF sends out uh, the recording and, you know, the, the chat stuff. And, and someone asked earlier about getting the, the PDFs. I, I, I'll, pro I'll do one better. Uh, Mally, I just asked you to help me remember. I have these collected as Word documents. I, I can send, I can have Mally post the file of Word because that way you can manipulate them. Um, So I'm seeing there's a bit of a delay in the audio. So what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send my collection of structures that support thinking so you can go in and go, oh, because right now you just, you're getting screen captures of essentially a Word document. And it's just so much, you don't have to recreate, you know, if you, if you like the, the for and against, just go in, change Henry VIII to Louis Riel, and where you go, and that kind of stuff. So that, I think it's the most practical way to do it. All right, uh, let me show you another. Uh, this is a... Grade 12, uh, European, now the, wor the world course, 1500 to the present. And if we wanted kids to look at, did Napoleon advance or betray the ideals of the French Revolution? Uh, well, the, the problem people have pointed out is, if I don't know what the ideals of the French Revolution are, I can't engage in your iterative thinking about it, so I first have to understand. So here's how we get kids to understand uh, just a little bit about, so, well, what were the ideals of the French Revolution? So, Mally, this is what I'm going to ask. If you could play the, 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 um, the history teacher video on the French Revolution. Okay, I've, I've put the, uh, the link in the chat. So I think what we're doing is just posting the link for, for you. Uh, yep. Uh, if you would... You know, watch, you know, come back, just watch, like, um, the first couple of minutes. I don't, you don't need to watch the whole thing. But if you could just watch the first, you know, two minutes or so up until, let's say, when she's talking about um, the tennis court oak or something like that. I'll just turn off my mic and let you watch the video uh, by clicking on the link that was posted. Okay, so I, I hope our, our, everyone's back, got a chance to watch uh, a, a bit of that. Uh, uh, by the way, just to, first of all, I should just pause. Does everyone hear me okay? Are you back from uh, the video? Uh, any comments on the video? If you enjoyed it or if it was new? Uh, by the way, if you're interested, if you go to uh, YouTube and, and put in the history teachers, uh, they've done 20, uh, sorry, they've done 57 of these. Uh, you may have seen some of them on the side. Things like um, uh, the Black Death done to Gwen Stefani's Hollow Back Girl or Cleopatra done to Fergalicious. Uh, Mummification done to Green Day's uh, Good Riddance. You know, I hope you had the time in your life. 
uh, quite interesting. By the way, just as an aside, uh, it could be another whole whole talk. Um, uh, these videos were created by a woman named Ernie Burval, and in June she just published a new book called Intentions: uh, Critical Creativity, and it is filled with uh, very practical ideas uh, in terms of infusing uh, creativity in teaching uh, that, that engages uh, good thinking and, and critical thinking. Um, she's a very creative teacher, uh, teaches in IB school in Hawaii, uh, but if you're looking for just you know, a collection of strategies, it's a very practical book because each, each strategy is set out in terms of what it's intended to do, how you would implement it in a lesson, what are some extensions. Like it's a uh, an interesting book if you want to infuse innovation and creativity in your teaching. Anyway, she's the woman behind behind these videos. I, I want to go back though to so so what I'm looking at is what are the structures as a sample. And in, when I was teaching the French Revolution, once we had uh, kids identify. By the way, notice in three minutes you've got an overview of the French Revolution. You've got the uh, the cry. You've got the Egalité, Fraternité, Liberté. We know the the, the goals of the French Revolution, you have an overview of the French Revolution, now we can dig into it in a unit. The way I approach this unit, each group of students, two or three students, were each given one of the topics, and they had to go and research. So for example, the first group, they had to come and present, you're going to speak on the storming of the Bastille and what happened, but you can't come up and just tell us that on July 14, 1789, you know, a group uh, stormed the Bastille, and, and it fell and that they were done. No, you have to be able to show, did it advance or undermine equality, fraternity, and liberty? How important was the storming of the Bastille in advancing the ideals of the revolution? As they work through, kids see, you know, perhaps that's a plus two, the tennis court oath, you know, reinforces to plus two. What about the execution of man tonight? Is that, is that showing equality, fraternity? Maybe some kids start to feel maybe that's a plus one because and they're gathering evidence, but having to always weigh it against a set of criteria. By the way, when we get to Napoleon's coup d'etat, I've seen some kids argue, well, by the reign of terror, that's already at a minus two. The revolution is being betrayed. We can't blame Napoleon. He may not have advanced it, but he didn't necessarily betray it, and then they follow it. Now, again, I'm showing you a structure more than uh, I'm interested in you than the topics. I mean, some of you may be able to say, I can use that, that approach tomorrow. I want you to see as as a, I want you to see this as a way of looking at a, a, a matrix where kids could be each given a topic. Uh, so I could retake that topic on climate change. Here are different factors. Each of you will take one, you'll research it, and you'll come and present around a set of criteria and make a judgment. So giving kids a learning, sorry, a decision-making matrix helps them cluster evidence around criteria to make a thoughtful decision. Uh, someone had mentioned Romeo and Juliet earlier in another context, so which is interesting. We have this one set up. Again, please uh, focus on the structure more than the specific topic. Uh, but we asked the question, fate or free will, which contributed more to the deaths of Romeo and Juliet? The structure we used in this case was a dashboard. So instead of a ranking ladder, we're using a dashboard. Notice we give the kids, we, we come up with some criteria. If fate were a dominant factor, these, it would meet these criteria. Do you think fate or free will played a bigger role? Now, by the way, I want to ask my kids, the very first day when they walk in, as we crack open the play to start studying it, before we even get into the play, I'm going to ask kids, which has a bigger role in your life? So typically, I think this is taught in grade 9 or 10, 14, 15 years old. What's having a bigger impact shape in your life, fate or free will? Could a few of you just type your response to that in the chat window? If you asked the average teenager what has a bigger impact on shaping their lives, would it be fate or free will? By the way, what I love is, notice I've got some people saying fate, some people saying free will. By the way, you'll notice on my dashboard there's a space for you if you want to say, well, I think it's more free will than fate, but it's not entirely free will. So someone who said both, Okay, are you dead center? They're equally, or do you think one has a slightly bigger? Where would you be on this? So kids set their dial somewhere from fate to free will. Now, what I want you to note is as we get into the play, we begin to study the act, understand, unpack the act. We're going to pause. Okay, 
given what you read in Act One and the discussions we've had, has Shakespeare caused you to rethink, to think fate or free will now? Would you dial your, your answer back a bit more? Would you move it this way? So notice we have this ongoing conversation with kids. Again, I want to stress, like I did earlier this evening, I don't care if you say more free will than, than faith throughout. You never change your view. As long as you can build a sounder and sounder argument to support that position, you don't have to change your position on the dashboard. You just have to build a better answer for it. So what you could not do is leave your, your, your arrow in the same place and just say, see above. You can't just say, well, I'm not changing because I've already decided after Act 1. What evidence in Act 2 supports? What evidence in Act 3? Uh, again, this is a Word document. I can send it so you can modify it and say, oh, I like the structure. I just want to swap out the topic. But this is that iterative thinking as kids, and you see their open-mindedness. They're willing to change their mind as they learn. I'm sorry, I should have asked you. Just what, uh, does anyone have a, a another example of how you might use the dashboard. So I, I, I wanted to pause. I'm keeping an eye on our time. I think we're OK. Anyone have another place where the dashboard, by the way, this is just a variation of giving kids a continuum to make sure that we're not asking binary questions, that it has to be fate or free will, but it could be somewhere in between. I'll give you another example while you come up with. Um, who was responsible for the outbreak of World War I? Primarily Germany and her allies, or its allies. Uh, more Germany than Britain, more Britain than Germany, mostly Britain and, and its allies. That would be another example of using this dashboard. Can I give a primary example? Um, can I think of from a primary? Um, oh, yes, yes, I can. Uh, I ask kids, uh, sorry, you're going to get a little bit of a weird setup. I ask kids, let me see how I phrase this. Do, this was the question. We, I was doing a lesson with the children on the water cycle. And I walked in, and right off the bat, I had a picture of dinosaurs out of water, out of, out of pond. And I asked the question, do we drink the same water as dinosaurs? And we used the dashboard. And on the left side, it said, no way. In the middle, it said, possible. And on the right, it said, yeah, it's likely. And the kids had to decide, where would you be if I told you we drink the same water as dinosaurs? Would you say, no way, that can't be true? Okay, that's possible. Or, yeah, that's probably true. Okay? And so kids now had to they took, by the way, most of the kids said, no way, that's, we don't drink the same water as dinosaurs. As they started to learn about condensation, evaporation, precipitation, and they began to understand the water cycle and started to see that within the earth, you know, there's a, a kind of a closed cycle of water. They began to say, oh, maybe it is possible. And by the end of the lesson, most kids had swung over and said, actually, I think we do. And they could give me a reason why. Uh, I might ask, how would you describe Shrek? Was Shrek like the best friend ever, a pretty good friend, kind of a mean guy or a really mean guy? Where would you put my dash? Let's start to read about, by the way, I could take a variety of characters. Let's read the story, pause as we're partway through the story. Have you changed your mind? Uh, now what do you think? By the way, I might have started off saying the character is a pretty good person, and in the end I'm in the same position because that's what the evidence supported. So I could invite kids, what do you think you're going to find out about this character? That they're very friendly, somewhat friendly, not so nice, not nice at all. So finding that range. I uh, hope that helped and, and made some sense. Again, keeping an eye on my time, I have a couple more I want to share with you. Uh, using a value line. Uh, notice, uh, very common in classes to use a timeline. A value line, so this is an example from in grade 7, grade 8, grade 10. Uh, as we think about Canada's 150th birthday, what should we celebrate and what should we commemorate? So when kids look at an event, instead of just plotting it chronologically, you know, that 1890 comes before 1914. As we look at an event, would you say, this is a great moment in Canadian history. This is worthy of a grand celebration. Well, it's, it's, it's positive, but uh, I don't think it's a grand celebration. So I put it above the line. No, this is actually a negative event. It should be commemorated. This is a hugely negative event. It should be not only commemorated 
uh, it should be there should be a sincere apology. Every time we take a, a thing, I'm going to tell kids about they're going to read about an event. They have to decide: Would you put that above the line or below the line? Would you put it way above the line or just a little bit above the line? Notice every day I teach a piece of content. Kids have to think about, and you could add perspective into this, above or below the line, how should we decide? Sorry for lack of time. I want to show you. This is using it for a novel study. Looking at the giver. Is the giver an ideal society? There's our criteria. The kids read the first chapter. They have to pull out two things that happened in that chapter and put them on the line. Would you put it above or below the line? As they work through every chapter, they have to pull out two events that they think are important to the chapter, and does it reflect this society being greatly enhanced uh, as an ideal or undermining an ideal society? Kids will see over time, well, the book began pretty good, but there's a, you know, they see the turning points and so on. I had a teacher do this um, with uh, a book called Wonder. Uh, if you know the book about Wonder, and, and the boys start school in grade five, and as they look at each event, was this a positive day for wonder or negative? And they had to look at the evidence. Um, an intermediate math example, um, looking at, and that's a good question, and time is pressing. Uh, if you could, at the beginning of the slides, you have my email. If you can send it as a reminder, my wife's our math specialist. I, I can send you a thought. I'm sure she has one. I need to show you one last one, and we're almost out of time. This is letting kids look at. Uh, what makes a, a powerful ad? Again, don't worry about the content, but we have some criteria. A good ad should be memorable, should be attention grabbing, should have a clear message, should prompt an emotional reaction. I want to show you very quickly uh, this this uh, ad. It'll take about 30 seconds. Um, could uh, uh, Mali? Um, could I get the link uh, posted for this one, and people can just take. 30 seconds and watch this one. Okay, so if you're back, anyone going to have nightmares as a result of me subjecting you to that video? <laughs> I'm sure there's some. Uh, it's a love it or hate it. Uh, I want to move this to a critical thinking from a love or hate, which is a preference. Uh, I thought it was the, the most ridiculous commercial. Uh, our daughter loves it. But I, we need to wrap up. I want to show you this is another structure we use to support student thinking. The head of the fish is the decision or judgment I want you to make. The tail of the fish is the judgment. Is this an effective ad? Uh, your decision will be that it's highly effective, somewhat effective, not very effective, or ineffective. Remember our criteria is the fins, and on the bones of the fish would be the evidence you would use to support that position. By the way, I can change this to say, is Trudeau an effective leader? Remember, an effective leader is charismatic, has a vision, is empathetic. We could have our criteria. What evidence can you find that he did or did not meet this, and what judgment would you give him? It's another structure. By the way, I could be using this in a single class or over a week. I just want you to think about, as you support our, our students, in being able to reason and write a sound, for example, a sound a paragraph. I think it's very important that we understand you're giving me two complex tasks when you ask me to decide is this an effective paragraph, uh, sorry, an effective ad, and write a persuasive paragraph arguing it is. For some kids, you've just bogged me down in two things. I want to I want to scaffold that by saying, don't worry about an effective paragraph right now. Gather your evidence. Let's make sure you've matched your right evidence to your right criteria. 
And let's make sure that when you weigh that evidence, that the decision you make in the end is consistent with the evidence you've gathered, that if most of your evidence supports this as really working, but you didn't like the ads, so you said not very effective, there's an inconsistency in the conclusion you've drawn given the evidence you've gathered. This helps me as a teacher in an efficient way make sure that kids' thinking is sound and reasoned based on the evidence and criteria. Once this is solid, let's talk about now how do we write a good topic sentence, how do we turn our fishbone into a well-written paragraph. It helps me to scaffold the learning. So I want to share that with you again as an example of a structure that helps kids gather evidence around a set of criteria to enable them to make thoughtful decisions before we ask them then to write a paper or whatever that might be. Now, I've gone over by a couple of minutes. Uh, I, I'm hoping that, uh, that, that you know, there's something in here tonight that you could say, hey, I could use that tomorrow. I'm going to try that, or I'm going to use a ranking ladder, I'm going to use a dashboard. Uh, I, I hope there are, are pieces that you can try it with your kids and, and they work well. Uh, we will get the slides sent out to you. Marley has the slides. Um, I will send on my, my uh, collection of structures that are just Word documents, and, and you can edit them as, as you want. I won't hold you up any more this evening. Thanks so much for your participation throughout, and, and, and have a great rest of your evening. Uh, they will be sent on. Uh, I'll let Nellie answer that question. Yeah, I'll thanks, send them to Nellie I hope you can, can hear me now. Can everybody else hear me? Yes, okay. So just a couple things really quick. So the first of all, uh, thanks, Garfield. I'm dying now to go to Gibraltar Airport just to check that out. And uh, great presentation. So um, the first thing is uh, if we could um, have everyone, uh, when you log out, the Blackboard session will automatically take you to a feedback link. And we'd really appreciate that if you could fill that in. And uh, after that's done, you'll be able to download a certificate of completion of this uh, webinar for your professional portfolio. Um, so thank you very much in advance for completing that. And next, there are um, lots of sessions from now until Christmas time for the OTF Connect sessions. And, and just to register, just as you did for this one, you could go to the OTF Connect's website and uh, take a look at the offerings and please register for um, um, additional sessions if you'd like to join. Um, there is some funding for AQ Math, Technology, and Kindergarten courses that's as well listed on the, um, on the